Give me a minute. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> I really got to do something about this thing. This cap is not playing. With, it's not playing right. All right. Okay. Cool. Now we're live. Um, inshallah. What's up, people? Welcome back to another Somali Corner episode. So today, today we've got a really special guest, um, Sheikh uh, Benjuma Bihari. Um, most of you who are connected to my channel, you might remember him or know him from Speakers Corner. Um, he's very, very well versed in African history. Um, and today's topic is going to be about you know the impact um, uh, Islam had on Africa. Or in Africa um, during the during the Islamic expansion, um, so Sheikh Benjamin Bihari is also well known in the um, Afri Muslim African uh, 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 community. Uh, he's very, you know, articulate. He's um, he's been, you know, he also I think um, he he's very knowledgeable in many uh, aspects of uh, Islamic history, African history, and I think he's the best person to actually cover the subject today because I've heard him speak about. Africa and Islam so many times um, back in Speaker's Corner um, and so I just thought you know maybe we should have this discussion today so I'm gonna welcome the platform to Sheikh uh, Danjuma Bihari so he can introduce himself inshallah Assalamu alaikum uncle so welcome wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh I want to first of all start by saying I'm not very conversant with the modern technology so if I suddenly disappear off the screen, it's because I have done something wrong, and you will have to need to, you you need to correct me from time to time. I ideally no ought to have a piece warning me what to do, but uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. these days of lockdown, we're freestyling it. Um, yeah, we are. <laughs> Subhanallah. Uh, I want to say thank you all, who have organized you and your group that have organized this. Thank you all for giving me the opportunity to come on and speak because I think it's very important that different communities within the Pan-African family get to hear about the perspectives of each other. And we are not expected to be of one mind. We, Africa is too vast a continent and it's the, the, the very nature of its geographical landmass admits a heterogeneity of peoples. And these peoples cannot or, or they all can't be expected to unite on everything at the same time. So we mm. have to learn to implement a, uh, a practice of compassion despite disagreement. And without that, it'll be very hard for us to, to proceed. Mm. And therefore, if there is, a, I don't know if there is, but if there is a question and answer period, and there are people who want to disagree or take issue with what I've said, you know, it would be it would be nice if we can disagree in the best way. True. If we find the best way of disagreeing, and we don't we don't have to agree for the sake of concord. We don't have to pretend we agree, but we can disagree. <laughs> nicely. We can afford yeah. to play nice. Now, I have been asked to discuss this matter, and it's Black History Month, and I thought it, two things dovetail here: mm. our responsibility to our race, our ethnicity, and our geography, and our mm. responsibility to our religion. Because for a long time we have been, some, there was a kind of subtle moral pressure up till about the last decade or so for African Muslims to feel as if they must choose. Mm. And invariably, it comes from Muslims who are well meaning but misunderstanding. And what they fail to understand is that Africa's unique history, Africa's history that has given African people to understand that whereas all races, if you imagine uh, um, that very fast Thunderbolt fellow um, from Jamaica, um, uh, the guy who runs very far. Oh, same, uh, Bol uh, same Bolt, yeah. If, if you, I don't know why, why, why I would have forgotten that. But if you imagine someone like that and others running a race, some people are faster out of the blocks than others. And we'll get mm. to the starting point faster. With our people, we're not even at the starting blocks in many ways. We're actually behind the starting blocks. So we have to actually run, we have to do that extra bit to catch up to the starting blocks, to get to the level playing field of the, of the beginning of the race. And mm. 
at times in trying to do that, we would be we would be acting out in ways that other Muslim groups consider to be ethnocentric. I will mm. come straight to one. Instead of dancing around the subject, I'll come straight yeah. to that point and say, and a lot, why, why I say they are well-meaning is because when we first came to this country, and I came in the 1980s, mid-1980s, yeah. there was a lot more xenophobia. There was a lot mm. more xenophobia from the heritage community. And it is their children and our children who today are interacting on a on a less unlevel playing field. I'm not going to say it's a level playing field. It's their children and our children that are now together interacting. And at very often our children, children of African parents, African Caribbean parentage, will come home and be surprised at some of the altercations, some of the problems, some of the, the arguments that they end up having, much to their surprise, because that generation was born Muslim, and a lot of the heritage communities, whether they're Asians, whether they're Turks, whether they're Arabs, they were they are born in this country. So that young generation may not see things the way my generation sees it. And when the, our children come home to us and explain certain problems to us, we sometimes shake our heads in despair saying, I thought we'd put this to bed since the 1990s. I thought mm -hmm. these problems were not, were a thing of the past. Imagine I was surprised to hear people saying things like, who is reluctant to marry whom and all the rest of it and that sort of trauma. Now, mm -hmm. when an African Caribbean Muslim African and Caribbean, I'm going to use the words together. When yeah. an African Caribbean Muslim of my age group, I'm almost 60, attempts to forewarn his children about possible xenophobia and racism when it comes to the selection of a marriage partner, our children quite, quite reasonably ask us, why, daddy, mommy, are you being so racist? What mm. is the need? Well, why do you need to? Let me just switch this phone off. It's no problem. Yeah, I realize it's gonna keep doing that. Yeah, and um, everybody, please do share um, with other people. This is a really interesting conversation. Um, hopefully, a lot of people join us in a bit. Sorry to, to interrupt. No problem. So what you so what you are finding is that there's a generation gap in the African and African Caribbean community. Mm. The old, my generation trying to uh, to protect our children from some of the problems we encountered with other ethnicities. And um, this is not to say Africans cannot be xenophobic as well, mm. but there is something, it is actually much truth to the concept within general racism of anti-blackness. There is mm. much truth to the, to the reality of anti-blackness. And it's something that is best remedied by education. And the best education to me is teaching not just my people or your people or our people, African people, their history, but making this history, this making it available for consumption to the wider Pan-African family and Muslims, Pan-Ummah. Okay. Yeah, because I think it's only with an understanding of our role in history will people and uh, will we understand how how little we need to do to rely on the good opinions of others mm. we don't need, and so for example it is you know i'll, I'll go back to some let, let me start with some tropes for example people will talk about the hijra as if it's fixed in stone and no hijri mm. the day the prophet wasalam, fled from Mecca to medina as the beginning of the muslim calendar so if an african woman says why can't we perhaps think in terms of the first hijra to Africa, to Abyssinia, mm. to Ethiopia. Mm. Mm. You're going to meet with rebuttals. You're going to meet, no one is even prepared to, let's kick the idea upstream. No, there is that default. Or oh, an African Muslim might say something. Let's talk about the place of black women, not just women, but black women in Islam. Mm. We have Hagar or Hajir. Mm. Who is 
the mother of the northern Arabs, in a sense. She is an African, but the mother of the northern Arabs through her son Ismail, which is the mother of both Arabs, and she's African. So when you perform the say, uh, the, the swift walking back and forth between the hills of as Safa and Al Marwa, you're as, as, a, as a pillar of the Umrah and the Hajj, you are yeah. actually performing an action of an African woman. When you <laughs> exactly. Drink, wow. When you drink yeah. the Zamzam well. And mm. I know a lot of your, your people like the name Zamzam. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we give them to our girls as well, you know. We got a lot of Hajjur, water. We have a joke. We say, with all the oil of the Arabic, the, the, the Muslim world, the mm. Arab world, well, Asia has oil to so the Muslim world. Mm. The next world war, World War Three, will not be fought over oil, but water. The scarcity, water scarcity. Mm. And that's why I mentioned Hajir, because when you can't talk of water without speaking of our great grandmother Hajir, that African lady who brought forth that Zam Zam well in what was up till that time a barren valley, the valley of Mecca. So when you speak about these things, mm. other communities are hearing them perhaps for the first time. And perhaps our own people are centering themselves for the first time. They've never they've done that before. So we speak of that water and the importance of water. And I'll come back to that because part of what my discussion will be is about mm. ecology. A little bit, I want to touch a little bit on the archaeology of Africa and mm. what Islam, what role Islam can play in mm. retarding the desertification of the Sahara, the Sahara mm. Desert, and, and, uh, and, and things like that. So I want to just briefly, I will come back to that. So we speak about our women like Hajar, mm. and we, I remember that she was carrying a man child, Ismail, alayhi yeah. in her arms. So that's the power of our women. That is what African women can do. We know wow. that, you know, as you know, in Somalia, in the army, women were a part of the army. You know, women are, were, were up front and center in the army. And in Algeria, in their war for Algerian independence, women were up front and center with their abayas, concealing, they would uh, the, dismantle the armaments, rifles and things, and conceal them beneath their abayas and hand them to the men. So we know that our women have this untapped potential, that power of Hajir, to carry a man, Ismail, to carry a man child in her arms through a burning desert to, to, um, um, between two high mountains. So that's, that's, that's water. We talk about blood. They said the first martyr for Islam, female martyr, Shahida. Mm. Shahida was an African woman, Sumeya. And, and it is said that she's from the Horn of Africa. Those who want to check, do the check, do the, they can do that. Uh, so that's water. We talk about blood. And if we want to talk about milk, who gave suck to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Who gave him suck? It was an African. It was an Baraka. African. Her name was Baraka. So we have a, wow. look at it. Blood, milk, water. Mm. Mm. So I want to just put that out there and leave mm. that centering our Africanity. And I'll move it forward now. So I want us... To, yeah, it's an interesting thing to look at because... When I was a child, as you know, they only talk after you receive a good, steady, unrelenting bout of racism. And finally, you snap and you complain about it. The first thing they would say is, but brother Bilal was black. Mm. That's, and you, you are meant to be pacified by that. That's a way of calming. You know, like you give a child a comfort. What's the thing they put in the children's mouth? Soother, a comfort. Uh, soother, yeah, yeah. Oh, child's mouth. Yeah, passive. Yeah. So, yeah. and after a while, we came to realize, well, look, Bilal was not the only black person in the Arabian Peninsula. Mm. And there's much more to Africanity in the Arabian mm. Peninsula than Bilal. But on top of that, what I wanted to look at is how Islam, as I said, apart from that first hijra, Islam, mm. planting roots in Africa, made an impact on Africa for better or for worse, and we'll discuss that long before it reached places like Indonesia, Central mm. Asia, South Asia, perhaps even Asia Minor, Turkey. Long before Islam had established itself in Africa. And, and I think there are a lot of people who actually do know this. Now, if you take 
um, East Africa, you will find that the culture of East Africa, its response to Islam is different in a lot of ways from West Africa. And people wonder why. And I often have to say, look, there's nothing, you can't talk about a prototype African. There is no such thing as the African prototype. You have to speak in terms of a series of African types. They're all Africans, but they're different kinds of Africans. But no one African is more African than the other. It becomes a nonsense to talk about that because there's a notion abroad. And I'm, I want to touch on these uncomfortable um, tropes that mm. West Africans are, or Central Africans are more truly African than Horn of Africans mm. or yeah. East Africans, coastal East Africans. Of course, if you're discussing the Islamic, and usually that is blamed, I'm using the word blamed, that is mm. blamed on the impact of Islam, which is True. said have decentered the East African and made him think he's an Arab. Now, in every blanket indictment, there is some truth. But let's unpack it. Let's pick the sense out of the nonsense. Mm. You got to pick the sense out of the nonsense. <laughs> and we've got yeah. to look at, yeah, we got, because, I, look, I've often said this. Life's perceptions change from when you're at primary school to when you go to secondary school to when you go to tertiary education. It changed, and sometimes the teacher at secondary school is unteaching you. He's unteaching what you learned at primary school. Or when you go to university, he will have to unteach you certain things. Why? You were taught a certain way that sufficed for that level of maturity. Now, wow. if you look at Africa from a great height, I remember this. I'll, I'll give you an example of what I mean. I like giving these little anecdotes. Uh, coming now from a very great height on Egypt Air, yeah. other airlines are available. And we were coming to land in Kano, the northern capital of Nigeria, very Muslim city. Mm. At a very great height, I said, but I didn't realize Kano was predominantly desert. That's because the airplane was at such a great height, I saw brown. Looking down, mm. you could see like desert. But as the airplane came lower and descended, you saw. No, this is not desert at all. This is scrubland. There are a lot of trees. There are more trees. Than the, and then as it came even further down to the ground, what I saw changed. I saw even water courses, areas where re seasonal rivers run. So what I'm trying to say is it depends on perspective. If people try to speak in generalities, they will just see brown Sahara from that great height. Mm, yeah. But as they home in on the research, they'll see that things are not what they look like from a great distance. And you know the old Ethiopian proverb, to lie about a far country is easy. So let's get up close and personal to Africa so nobody can tell us lies about Africa, mm. right? Let's get up yeah. close and personal. So what we're looking at is not just a barren desert. There's a lot happening once you get up close and personal. Now, what I'm trying to talk about here is the differences the perceived differences between East and West Africa. Remember, mm. East Africa shares much closer proximity to the center of Islam. If we're considering the center of Islam to be Mecca and Medina, mm. East Africa shares a much closer proximity. In fact, it is said that the Kawahala Arabs lived in the Hejaz, from the Hejaz to Jizan to Yemen, but mostly mm. from between Hejaz and Jizan. And they migrated crossing the Red Sea into Swakin, Eastern Sudan, the Kassala province today, long before the rise of Islam. Oh, so wow. there are, yeah, so you know, and when you look at these people today, they look like you and me. Some of them, like the Rashaida, who arrived mm. much later, crossing mm. the Red Sea into Eritrea and into Sudan, more look like what we typically describe an Arab today. That will be Bani oh. Rasha. Yeah. Okay. But the Kawahla don't. So it tells me something, perhaps, and I'm putting a lot of supposes and perhapses to there. Perhaps when we think of Jazeera al Arab, the Arabian Peninsula, it seems to me historically the proto Arabian was a black person. What we mm. typically call a Negro. I don't like using the word, but for, mm. say, for, visual, for visual sake, I'll just use that word. Now, mm. as migrated out of Africa using that path, mm. moved along. Some moved into the Middle East area, but 
via the coast, always hugging the coastline. So through the Horn of Africa, they would have gone into Yemen. Well, I'm using modern day terms, Oman, then into crossing again the Persian Gulf, Iran, Iraq, Iran, then into India becoming the, well, first of all, the people of Elam and Ur, and then the people, the Dravidians of Mohenjo-Daro and Harappa in Bak which is today Pakistan. And then you find them today in perhaps the best preserved form in South India, in Tamil Nadu and Kerala. You find them in the southern part of India. So mm -hmm. as the area became greener, other people started moving in. Of course, it's a, it's, it's a green area. People, the Sahara was like that. The area was once green between 7,000 to 2,000. It started drying up and only people who could tolerate the aridity remained. People who were adapted, people who introduced like the camel who could live mm. with animals that could take them here and there in the desert. So what you find is Arabia began to become less Negroid, putting up my fingers for people to see this, became mm. less like and more people from central, um, the Near East started moving in. People like who were related to the Assyrians, Assyrians, the old Assyrians, those sort of people, and their languages, Semitic languages would have been related. So Semitic languages started developing in that area and then moving into the Arabian Peninsula. There are other languages, as you know, in the Arabian Peninsula today, in the southern part, Hadramaut. Uh, like Mehri and others that are not exactly Semitic languages. You see, and they, 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 some are and some aren't. And they, in Oman, they are told that there are eight languages. So wait, the, Mahri are not, the, Mah the Mahri are not part of the Semitic languages? Apparently the Mahri may, I, I, I'm not sure, don't quote me, but I'm, okay. I think I'm almost certain in people, that's why we have this modern technology. People can check this and yeah. correct me. True. There are other languages too. I don't have Sokotran. There's one called Sokotran. Sokotran, yeah, yeah. Sokotra Island. Yeah. Yes, and, and so forth. So people can have a good look around at these things. But what I am trying to point out is that the area was once darker than it is today. Mm. The Arabian Peninsula was darker than it was today. And mm -hmm. testimony of that is people moving across the Red Sea back and forth, even before Islam. Now with the, with the rise of Islam, it increased that sort of Red Sea and, um, Red Sea and Indian Ocean trade. People start moving more. So then you get, as you know, the development of Islamic settlements in Sela and places like that. You start getting the Saudi city states along the coast from um, Adishu to, to Maputo, or um, mm. Mozambique Island. You get the Swahili mm. city. You get a short interregnum where the Persians themselves from Shiraz, you know, established themselves for a short time in Zanzibar. And so there's that Swahili civilization that develops. Now, because most of these traders, the Somalis and the Swahilis, were mm. maritime traders, they followed a pattern of the monsoon winds. So their trade mm. oriented them outwards towards the ocean, the Indian Ocean, mm. facing mm -hmm. the rising sun. So in a sense, their backs were to Africa and their faces were to the rising sun. So mm. the when they did trade in interior Africa, it was mm. done through the agency of middlemen. If you take a place like Tanzania, where you have a Swahili trade through Sofala, through Kilwa, through um, mm. Z maybe not yet, Z not, maybe not yet Zanzibar, but Kilwa definitely, mm. and Sofala. What you got is they would trade porcelain and jade from as far as China. These Africans mm. with inland ancient kingdoms like Zimbabwe, which had gold, which had ivory, which had ebony, and perhaps soapstone, for which it, mm. that area is still famous, tortoiseshell perhaps too. So, but the the Afri the, the Swahili people, if you, or the Somalis, or the, 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 the coastal Muslims, did not make those journeys into the interior until much later with the rise of the Omanis. In the okay. early stage of settlement on that of Islam on the coast, mm. from about let's say 800 mm. to about 1505, I would consider that period of Swahilization a period of Swahilization and not Arabization, because the Arabs and the Persians who arrived arrived in such few numbers that no sooner had they arrived than they lost their language. They retained words from their language 
which made its way into what is called Swahili today. But it, has, it is known that the Swahili language belongs to the Bantu group of languages closest related perhaps to Baduni and Mijikenda and mm -hmm. um, Giriyama, the coast. It's, it's a form of coastal Bantu with a lot of Arabic, Persian, and perhaps Portuguese words, some Port and a couple of Hindi or Hindi words and yeah, that came yeah. during the early period, as we know. Yeah, like, in the like, like the word pesa and patia pesa, stuff like okay. that, you know, that's yeah. Indian. Yeah. yeah. So we we know that that history has oriented those people towards the the ocean. The trade took mm. them to Indonesia, to China, to the Maldives, to the Lakshadweep, the Lakadives, to the Mascarene Islands, to the Comoros, mm. to Madagascar. Trade took them in that direction. So, in fact, in Swahili, when they use the word Nika, Nika refers to the hinterland in Africa, the outback. With a, mm. it, it has a kind of an almost pejorative meaning that this is an area we don't concern ourselves with. It's mm. to the back of so the focus of East African Islam and the proximity to the, the Arabian, the centers of Islam have given it a different flavor and outlook than West African Islam. West African Islam developed almost an organic, it was a, like something that grew almost organically by being detached and having to root itself in that far-flung soil. Because when you think of centers like Tuba and to Mbuktu and Jenni, they were really far. That was the rim of the Muslim world, given the very vastness of the African continent. Your area is the east, but that's the west. And that's how much space is in between. They say the Sahara is as big as the United States. Or perhaps it's bigger. I think mm -hmm. it's even bigger. So yeah, imagine, yeah. Yeah, yeah, imagine cities like Shingit and uh, the Mbuktu and those places, they are the far end of the Muslim world. They develop an indigenous tradition that has a kind of flavor that for which it is immediately distinctive. It's distinguished by the clothes they wear, the foods they eat, the, the, culture. Things, the culture. And that, that's what brings me to geography. As I said, mm -hmm. I wanted to look at that in terms of how human beings have interacted with this environment. People are saying, look, there's a body of opinion that says Islam was bad for Africa. Islam was good for Africa. Which is it? It depends on where you stand in this sort mm. of discussion. And it, it, it brings me back to why we study history. Because if we don't know our history and we listen to the person who is in the aeroplane that does not come down very low, the aeroplane that stays high, he will tell you that the land over the city of Kano is brown desert, and you will believe that because you know no better. But if you embark upon that journey yourself, you will see the difference and be able to say to the person, look, it depends on perspective. Yes, some of what you're saying is true. I'm not saying that the city of Kano is located in the Congo rainforest. I'm not saying mm -hmm. it's it's lush and teeming with all manner of tropical fruits. But at the same time, it is not the desert you think it is. And it is for us, as y yourselves, as younger Muslims, to bring that nuance, to bring that sort of, um, that level of discussion to the table. Mm, true, because yeah. As you grow into much, um, <laughs> as you interact more with other black communities, non-Muslim communities, you have to be able to have an answer for some of the arguments they will put to you denouncing Islam and the role of Islam in Africa. Now, not all of what they're saying is inaccurate, but sometimes if you tell half a story and that half story becomes the whole story, and now I'm quoting the famous Nigerian writer Chimamanda Aditye, who said, mm. the danger of that single story mm. is it becomes mm. the only story. So then Islam was spread in Africa by the story. That's it. That becomes the story. Islam was spread in Africa by the sword. I would like to think Islam in Africa was spread more by the pen than by the sword. 
That's true. Especially when we look at Tumbatu and many other African regions, it's like, you know, it's, it's incredible when you look at the amount of knowledge these people had. Yeah. Now, it's not devoid of truth, what that person mm. said. Of course, in the northern part of the continent, when the first Muslims erupted out in, through the Sinai Peninsula, Egypt, passing Egypt, and they went into the, Bab the Maghreb, there were bloody wars of conflict. There were wars of bloody conflict for 50 years. It took 50 years to reduce the Berbers to tolerating any form of Arab rule. And even when the Berbers embraced Islam, they made a point of decoupling themselves from Arabism by becoming Khawarij, Kharijites, and some became Shia in the beginning. It's not like that now. So what I want to look at is where Islam spread more by the pen than because that apart from that northern experience, mm. the rest of Islam in Africa does not pursue that trajectory. We do know about the, the Nubian adventure when having conquered Egypt with only 4,000 men, Amr ibn yeah. Alas dispatched an emissary, Abdullah, to go and conquer the king of Nubia. Mm -hmm. And in two battles, he was beaten back. And as I said, often said before, it was the first time in history the Arabs actually received a bloody nose. <laughs> first time yeah. in history. And so they yeah. settled down to the treaty, which was called al Bak, And I've uh, discussed this many times before. But it is in during that period from about 652 down to the Mamluk period around 1250 that Islam began to enter Nubia peacefully. During the Mamluk period, there were bloody clashes. Yes, during the Mamluk period in Egypt, there were clashes. Mm. But that is also partly responsible for the fact that in one or two of the Crusades, which were happening in Palestine, Mm. Nubians had actually sent detachments of warriors to help support their Christian co-religionists. So wow. it, is, it was not an unprompted um, attack on the Nubian states. There are two sides. That's why I say, yes, the, there was a process of mission creep from Egypt, particularly during the Mameluk period, into mm. what is the northern Sudan. There, were, there was a policy of mission creep. By some of the trade, by the trading relationship they managed to exact with the Nubians who had defeated them. The Nubians had defeated the Arabs, remember. And mm. point of order, when people talk about Egypt having been overrun by the Muslims, we do have to bear in mind that Egypt, which was a supposed to be a powerful civilization, or the remnant, the rump of a powerful civilization, was defeated with only 4,000 men. In fact, a lot of Egyptians at that stage in their history were conflicted, very conflicted about which brand of Christianity to follow. Ever since the Roman period, they had become Christians that either St. Mark or St. Anthony brought Christianity, which is still in the form of the Coptic church today. Mm. And um, there were different brands of Christianity contesting. Even in North Africa, the Donatists, the Monophysites, the this, the that. Were, and when Islam came and said, look, all of that is to, let's make it plain. Let's make it simple. One book, one God, one language. A lot of people were attracted to Islam and a lot of people actually supported the Muslim invaders. And for those who think it was an African civilization being overrun by marauding Arabs, we have to remember that when the bishop, I always forget his name. When, is it Obeida? Obeida Allah? An emissary oh, was okay, sent. I'm not, I'm not familiar with him, sorry. <laughs> this name always escapes me. I always give yeah. this talk, and I always end up doing this. Uh, the bishop of, the, the patriarch of Alexandria received mm. a delegation from the Arab army and says, take this Negro away from me. Take wow. this black man away from me. How dare you say? And to which the, um, Amr al ibn Allah said, they have many, many more like him in the Arabian Peninsula where we come from. He's not the only one. It tells you two things. Number one, this was past the heyday of Egyptian civilization and those Egyptians were not Africans in, in, in the Negroid or the black sense of the word. The Egyptians at the time of the Arab invasion of North Africa in 640 AD were not African in that sense of the term. Obeida, 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 
and I'm trying mm. to remember to catch up staying right. It's it's gone, it's gone now. <laughs> no um, so it tells you one thing for those people who think that Muslims overran an African civilization, Kemet, ancient Egypt, had long passed into history. The civilization of ancient Kemet had ever since the time of the Persians. I mean, there was the Hyksos invasion in 670, but they weathered that storm. They weathered the Hyksos. But by the time, when, when the Persians, in, uh, well, no, before the Persians, there were the Assyrians. Assyrians, 663 BC. I think it was Ashur, Ashur Banipal. It could have been the leader. They, 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 they wrought a lot of destruction. Then came 525 BC, the Persians, I think it was Cambyses. Cambyses, the Persian. He was, the, the Persians were responsible for a lot of destruction of ancient Egypt. True, and, yeah. But they're not Muslims, okay? Then mm -hmm. all of them were the Greeks in 324 BC, around yeah. that time. With, you know the famous Iskander, Alexander the Great? Yeah, Alexandra, yeah, Alexandra. Yeah. It wasn't so great, Greek, but yeah. To do the Greeks' yeah. credit, they spent yeah. a lot of time learning. The Greeks weren't no fools. They spent mm. a lot of time learning. In fact, it is said, the glory of classical Greece, the glory of owes its inspiration to an island called Crete, somewhere mm. between Egypt and the Greek and, and Greece. And in mm. that island, there was a confluence of cultures, Phoenician, Pharaonic Egyptian, and a touch of Greek. And that's where the Greeks really came to understand. That's where they really got awakened to civilization from ancient mm. Egypt via Crete. The Minoan, that's it. The yeah. Minoan civilization. Also, so, if you could correct me, um, they say that many uh, Greek philosophers, they um, gained their their wisdom and their studies from Egypt. And then before before they went back to Greek and implemented those. Is that, that's true, the, isn't it? The famous, uh, um, you know, in those days, fear, love of wisdom. So a philosopher wasn't, he could have been a chemical engineer, but they would call him yeah. philosopher. The famous <laughs> yeah. philosopher. Diodorus Siculus, Diodorus mm. the Sicilian, puts it in geographical terms. Egypt, all Egypt descended from the mud and slime of Ethiopia. Mm. To which the Greeks came and learned as children. The Greeks came to Egypt as children. They learned from the ancient. But I suppose people want to hear more about Islam. So I just brought that in so that my Pan-African family can understand when we talk about Islam invading North Africa. Yes, it did. We must not pretend it did not. But as far mm -hmm. as Egypt was concerned, it was more or less, in the, by, by the standards of the day, it was more or less a peaceful conquest. The real, it really hotted up in the Maghreb, the, what was called the Barbary States, beyond Libya, Tunis, Morocco, Algeria. It really, and yes, and here's the funny thing, here's the kicker about that. And this is mm. in no way a form of exonerate. This is by no means to exonerate the Arabs for what they did. But okay. the Berbers were in the mass lighter skinned than the Arabs who were trying to colonize them. I put my, people don't like it, but this is how I put it. That bit of Islam was very, had a very imperialistic tone to it in North Africa. There was a very, mm. they, they seem to have quite quickly lost the spirit of the message. And as they say, absolute power corrupts absolutely. These people had mm. tremendous power. They were aware of their strength. They were fired with the zeal of the religion. And mm. it takes a strong human being not to let that go to his head. I always make a joke about you know, the angels had to wonder, Allah, why do you ask us to bow <laughs> down to this? You don't know yeah. what this thing, this theme, mm. this, this earth is capable of. Allah said, mm. I don't know what you know about. Right? Yeah. For yeah. human beings are like that, that's human history. But I just want to put that in for my Pan-African family who think that the Berbers were, were black. The Berbers at the time of the prophet were in the map. I'm not saying there were no black Berbers. You remember mm. at the time of the Roman conquest, mm. the Romans delineated three provinces corresponding to what is part Morocco Tunis today. The western most of the three, well, it was Numidia, 
Second, Africa. The third, and, and westernmost province corresponding to the Atlantic coast, well, the town of Larache is today in Morocco, was, that province was called Mauritania. Now, Morus gives us an idea that the people might have been what's left Mor of the proper black in more, what's left mm. of the proper properly black people in North Africa. It is my contention, and people can contradict me, and as I say, let's do this with, uh, with, with compassion, yeah. It's my contention that North Africa, the Arabs were browner skinned than the people that they were that they were attempting to colonize in North Africa, the Berbers, the so-called Berbers, mm. the mm. Americans, or uh, as they prefer to be called today. But the mm. Romans called them Barbari, Barbaros, Barbari, Barbarian, Berber, and even the word today, Arabic Berber, the verb means mm. to speak gibberish, to speak yeah. in an unintelligible <laughs> So perhaps it's yeah. not the best term to be, but if I say Berber, people who don't know the term Amazigh, Amazighan may not understand what I'm talking about. We, we, when we talk, so people ask, well, Brother Juma, you say this, but the Moors in Spain were meant to be black people. And I say yes and no. A bit of nuance again is required here. It seems to me that the really dark-skinned Moors entered Spain in the 11th and 12th centuries with the Almoravids mm. and the Almohads, respectively. Almoravidun, uh, uh, under uh, use of Tashfid in the, in the 11th century, and later with Ibn Tumar, the Almohadun, the, the Almohads, in the following century. Uh, mm. Especially the time of the Almoravidun, the Almoravids. The Almoravids were actually in concert with the people of Tekrur on the banks of the Senegal River. Tekrur was properly African. Now you're in proper sub-Saharan Africa, West Africa. Imagine Senegal today, where it borders with Mauritania. Imagine the border. It's actually the river, and the river is called the River Senegal. Mm. The river and the country is like how the Gambia, what they call the Gambia after the river. In fact, there's a joke. Let me... Every now and then I like to leave people with a little factoid, a little amusing factoid, because this can get a bit more, you know, it get tedious. So uh, yeah. it is said that it might be a guy, one of those French colonizers called Feyderb. Feyderb, my French is not very good. Those mm. Djibouti, don't try to correct my French. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think they can correct my Somali, but don't correct my French. So <laughs> okay. there was a film. Um, he saw this guy meddling about with his boat on the river. This African dude. And mm. the word for boat, that sort of canoe, a sort of canoe looking boat, is gal yeah. in Wolof. In Wolof, the boat okay. is gal. So okay. the guy spoke to him in French, like, well, what's that? He asked him, um, what's the name of the river? So the guy didn't think somebody would be asking him about a river. He thought he's asking mm. him, who owns that? He said, say no gal, it's our boat which is broken mm. French. Send okay. you back in our boat. Like, where you, what, what you got your eyes on that for? <laughs> <laughs> and that's what they say. And so the word Senegal, Senegal came from that okay. French and Gal. Wow. Who so, knew? Who knew? <laughs> for people who were interested in little factors. But yeah. the Almoravids, a lot of their cavalry came from the people of an ancient kingdom, one of the first sub-Saharan African kingdoms in Islam called Takrur. And that, okay. that is why, as a matter of fact, if you have relatives in Saudi Arabia, yeah, yeah. if you have, yes. they may sometimes use a very pejorative term to call blacks, they call them Takaruni. Takaruni. Okay. Yeah, Takaruni is a very funny word. Takaruni goes back as far as the ninth century as far as when pilgrims and scholars from the ancient empire of Takrur used to overland by foot all the way across what you call the Sudan corridor, that bit of green between the desert, the Sahel, yeah. between the desert and the actual forest area. They used to walk through those countries like, you know, northern Nigeria, Sudan, cross the Red Sea and go for Hajj. Mm. And they were so well known for their scholarship. They were so prominent, high profile. Those that kingdom of Takrur, that mm -hmm. the Saudi actually gave all West African coming for Hajj or for study, Takaruri, Takaruri, Takaruni. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. That's the real word. Yeah.
But now today, I must tell you, it's used in a... In a very derogative way. Yeah, very derogative, derog derogatory sort of way. Yeah. So, okay. I think the Moors, the Black Moors, they're, they're, another word enters history. We hear the word Moor, and then we hear the word Blackamoor. Mm. In history. Blackamoor. I, Blackamoor. The, in, in English literature particularly, you hear a lot mm. of the time the term Blackamoor. So you have Moor and you hear Blackamoor. However, mm. here's where the confusion arises. In Shakespeare, mm. in The Merchant of Venice, the word Moor and Negro are used interchangeably. So let me okay. back up a bit. I'm saying that I think the blacker Moors, the more African looking Moors came during, mm. in, in large numbers, during the 11th century with the Almoravids. They were the backbone, the, the strike, the shock cavalry troops of the mm. Almoravids, of the Almoravids. And um, perhaps it is perhaps then when the word black more perhaps enters the English vocabulary because they were well known, the, the, mm. the very dark. But as for the period between 7 11 when Tariq bin Ziyad Fatah, uh, conquered Al Andalus, when Tariq bin Ziyad entered the Berber ex slave enters the Andalus to up to that 11th century, I can't put my hand on my heart and say that yeah. the more were Negroid. Like properly in the in, in in the general sense, but coming yeah, but we can say they had dark skin because that's, that's yeah, yeah yeah dark skin yeah I yeah from Mauritania, and then the Arabs themselves were not as fair skinned as they are today. Yeah, true, I agree you with see? you as well. Yeah, so, well, there are two kinds of Arabs that were uh, the bulk of the more the the Muslims that they that entered Spain. Some were mm. many were from Yemen, but mm. uh, which would, would be a bit darker. But then others were from Syria, so you had that you know, kind of there, there is a even when we look at today, because it's like the best way to identify to um, uh, to factualize a certain historical uh, claim is that we look into genetics. For instance, uh, when we look at Yemen and the Horn of Africa and many parts of Africa, like North Africa, Berbers and them, them lot, they share a particular sort of DNA which shows that, you know, these people belong to one another. And then there is this DNA, like the J-DNA, which a lot of people think is a is an Arab bone, is a Semitic DNA, which is really, <laughs> is, is a really false statement. It came from uh, Europe and, you know, one of these Euro European caves and all of that stuff, if you follow the actual origin of it. So, yeah, so there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. And I, I do agree with you when you say they had dark skin. Um, but then there are people who would say then, because earlier you mentioned um, uh, African look, you know. So uh, someone also asked me, what do you mean by that, you know, when you say African look? Well, yeah, it seems as it almost appears a contradiction in terms of when I started by saying Africa yeah. is a continent of types, not type. So to then say what an African look. What I mean yeah. is, what I, I, I know what I mean. I mean, I have this joke. I have this yeah. joke. I said, why do the Rastas prefer Haile Selassie as God to Marcus Garvey? <laughs> and, yeah. Why does the nation of Islam have far Muhammad as the? Why do black people like the pale skinned black people to 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 look up to? As a little joke of mine, because we can't have an idea that Marcus Garvey was more Negro than mm. Haley said, and it would be mm. a nonsense for me to pretend that there are no physical, physiological differences mm. between mm. Imperial Majesty Haley Selassie and Papa Marcus, Marcus. Mosiah Garvey. I can't yeah. look at. That. And there are no physical differences between them. What True. I'm saying is the early out of Africa migrations, the proto Arabian, the proto inhabitant mm. of Arabia was more like Marcus Garvey. They were more okay. than they As okay. time for what keeps up, you, you have to conceive of the seas, both the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. You gotta conceive mm. of them as not just sending information one way. Mm. Because in the early, we think in the early time of history, out of Africa, one way, Africans left and went to the Arabian Peninsula. Then later, mm. we think of invasions. People invaded, Africa gets invaded, it's only one way. In that early stage, think of it as if the sea pushes what is from Ethiopia and Somalia to Yemen. Okay. And then the wave comes back. It doesn't come back with what it took. It comes back with something from that side, but a little bit of what it took still comes back. So you get a mm. web on a warp, you get like a loom, you get an interchange of peoples and cultures. So it's not that everybody left 
looking like Marcus Garvey, and in one generation they turn to Selassie, and then in the next generation they turn white. It's not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a process you know, of graduation. It's graduated. You see, mm -hmm. and I don't like to. I mean, you have the advantage of me. I studied anthropology at a time when there wasn't any genetic, any, the science mm -hmm. of genetics had not been brought to bear, or even the yeah. way there weren't even computers at the time when I, yeah. when I started. But what I will say is this. I like to talk about how humans view themselves. And mm. in terms of being Black History mm. um, Month, we're trying to look at all of the peoples that we commonly agree upon that are African. And these mm. people have, in my opinion, my, my personal perspective is that Pan-Africanism, like the Ummah, they are both aspirational. They're both aspirational, they're both ideals. And however we choose to come about them, I think nobody, no Muslim says that they don't look forward to a time when there is much more unity among the Ummah. And to that I agree. By the same token, I also believe given the unique history of the African continent, we must likewise look forward to a time when there's a greater strength, if not unity as we understood the term in the 1970s, if not that kind of unity, definitely links between the different parts of Africa must be strengthened. There must be, it has to happen because if you look at how a time in history we were exploited by Europeans, now we're being exploited by Chinese. And this sure. will continue. You, you, you've got to actually make this uncomfortably topical. If we, I mean, history, why are we talking about history? History is yeah. not only the good that we were all kings. We all came from sure. Wakanda, we were all kings. No, that's <laughs> not enough. What yeah. we need to know, okay, where did we also mess up? How much, of, how much of that mess up do we own? How much we did, we gotta not compartmentalize it in order to allocate culpability. Oh, the white man, this and the Arab, that. I'm not saying that they were not wrong. What I'm saying is we need to be able to know how to fix up. That's what we need to do. And I, I am not, I'm not, I'm gonna have very little patience with anyone mm. asking, I will be civil. I will have very little patience with anyone telling me that Pan-Africanism is, is, is inverted race, what we call it, reverse racism? It's racism, reverse yeah. racism. It's, it's practicing exactly what the white man did to us. I'm not going to have any truck with that because, I mean, the Native Americans are not really in sufficient strength. There is a red power movement, but the Native mm. Americans are not in sufficient strength to be able to salvage and reclaim what is theirs in sure. a North and South and Central America. Mm -hmm. If you look at the state of the Australian Aborigine, his neighbor, the, peop the, the original people of Tasmania were exterminated. Extermin they no longer exist. And I am not going to sit around trying to forge links with people who don't have our best interests at heart, who then use that perceived unity against us. So we have to be clear, like Abi Ahmed said in Ethiopia, when he said, and he made a very bad enemy when he said it, in mm. the Emir of uh, Dubai, the Emir of Dubai, when he said, um, the, I forget, the, uh, Rashid, what's the name of? The, the Emir of Dubai was asked, offering him some help to teach, uh, to learn Arabic, that Ethiopian Muslims could learn Arabic. Yeah. And he said, Ethiopian Muslims, yes, we should learn Arabic. But that's where our relationship ends. There is nothing about Islam you can teach an Ethiopian Muslim or an African Muslim. Yeah, I've, I've heard that one, yeah. Stop meddling in other countries. Stop creating mm. problems. In, in Libya, stop creating mm. uh, and then you know stop making peace with Israel of uh, these kind of weird contradictions before you come and tell us uh, that it mm. is your it is your role and duty to teach us and for us to sit and learn from you. And I think we have to yeah, that was... uh, be a little controversial and say that as Muslims, sometimes Islam has been used as a Trojan horse True. to get under our people to get them now to act against their own interests, right? And this is not Islam, this is Arabism. This is Arabism. And I remember when Ethiopian maids were being 
sexually taken advantage of mm. in the kingdom of Saudi in Arabia. A, in Arabia, yeah. Uh, there was I, this one, there was, sorry to interrupt, there was, there was this one incident that I've seen 2018. There was this Ethiopian, um, like she was really beautiful, by the way, who was, uh, she was a maid in an Arabian a household. And uh, for some reason, the person that she was working for uh, impregnated her, but then she was trying to hide her pregnancy. But one day she bore the child in the kitchen and um, the, the 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 woman of the, like the wife of the husband comes to the house and she finds out the baby, and she that means she's just looking up to the Arab woman, telling her like, please don't hurt me, don't hurt my baby. And guess what they do? Like this, I mean, I'm really sorry that I'm saying this, but this is the amount of like disgusting thing that's going on in Arabia. They hanged the woman from the rooftop. I don't know what happened to the baby, but that's what happened. And this is something that people need to know. You know, yeah. and that like that was the one of the most horrifying thing I've ever seen in my life. So you're right. You know, it's yeah. it's not Islam, or I don't think. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. But um, sorry. Uh, then I, the thing is, like, we've got one hour left, so right. um, I, I want to get to get to the go. impact and the negative, the, the, the positive and the negative impact of Islam okay. in Africa. I, That's the most I brought actually I haven't even discussed this book that I wanted to discuss. Yeah. So yeah. I want to actually draw people's attention to this book. Can mm -hmm. you read it? Can you see the title? Yeah, The Corpses of Early yeah. Arab... Is the Arabic, Arabic Sources? Sources for, for West Africa what? History. For West Africa History, okay. As you can see on my shelf, I have uh, a lot more books I wanted to talk about. I wanted to talk mm -hmm. about Futa al the um, mm -hmm. conquest of Abyssinia, which is a lot yeah. to do with your people knocking seven bells out of the Christians of Ethiopia, and they're trying to knock seven <laughs> bells out of you guys. Lots of lovely history. Yeah. <laughs> Perhaps we won't yeah. have time for it all. Yeah. But what I will say is, the reason yeah. I picked up this book is yeah. because it's about written sources. Mm. Oh, sorry, I'm doing it. Yeah. It's about yeah, written, written sources. Okay. And I want us to understand the impact of writing that Islam had on African societies. In mm. my opinion, it was a good thing. There are people who would contend that a lot of preliterate or oral culture was lost because of the introduction of writing. I disagree. I disagree. I think mm. there's much, you know, you heard the expression Chinese whispers. Yeah. But you said something, by the time you cast out the other, the light is completely <laughs> story. It's a, it's a whole different story. <laughs> right. And, yeah. I, and the interesting thing about so that you can corrupt something in writing, but I mm. think there's a greater chance of corruption or having forgotten something if it's mm. only committed to memory. If only, it's only, I think what happens is in Africa, you, you look at the comparison between ancient Egypt and civilizations that followed. Ancient Egypt developed the use of papyrus, karpas, papyrus, from, the, from an, uh, an Egyptian sedge that grows by the river, which they made paper from. And they developed a form of ink and the ancient Egyptians used to write. Notice how that civilization leapt ahead in quantum bounds mm. because of these, this ability to disseminate information. Even if every Egyptian, and I'm not saying every Egyptian was literate, but even if every Egyptian wasn't literate, you had a person who could read a scroll to an assembly or send it to another town, whether it's whatever town, the Edfu or Komombo or some other town up in Upper Egypt from, from the Delta. Similarly, mm. so now you have African civilizations like Wagadu, ancient Ghana. Not Muslim yet, Islam arrives. Islam arrives via two sources, the Almoravids, but before the Almoravids, like I mentioned before, to the west of Wagadu or ancient Ghana, Takrur. Takru had already introduced Arabic writing. They wrote not only Arabic, they wrote mm. their Fulani, the language they mm. spoke was a kind of Fulani. In that part of uh, Africa, they call that kind of Fulani Pular. Fulani is such a, it covers such a wide range of countries in the, in the zone from between Ghana to Sudan, they call that kind of Fulani language Pulpulde. But pul -pul Full, full day, but going okay. from Guinea Conakry to Senegal, maybe they call it Pular. And so they were writing, they were writing. And look at the efflorescence of knowledge where they said at the time, and I'm, I'm skipping ahead 
over Wagadu, but let, let, let's not skip Wagadu because the Pan Africanists want me to talk about that, and I want yeah. I want to get away from it because you know the yeah. old joke that the the Almoravids destroyed the ancient empire of Ghana. Well, we all know that's not true. I just have to. I'm yeah. saying it for the people who still don't know it, but everybody knows the Almoravids did not conquer and destroy in 1076 ancient Ghana or Wagadu. Mm. They did not. Ancient Wagadu had already become suffused with Islam through contact with the Takrur people, the same, and there was a particular king called Warjabi, but also mm. the Sanhaja Berber trade, the Trans-Saharan trade. Now, you're mm. doing Trans-Saharan trade, you're going to need to keep accounts. In order to keep accounts, bills of lading, receipts, invoices, you're going to have to write. Therefore, you True. need literacy. The larger your empire becomes, the larger your kingdom, once your kingdom starts becoming an empire, the, its yeah. systems become more complex. The complexity True. will require more streamlining. Writing yeah. was, the, was the high technology of the day, and Islam introduced that into mm. West Africa, where at one point, skip ahead now from Wagadu to a demanding empire, where it was said in Timbuktu, books mm. were valued as much as gold. And remember, wow. gold came from this area. The, the confluence of the Baffing and the Falemé rivers in Senegal was one source of, of, of West African gold. Later on, the Upper Niger was another source of gold. And as today we know, in Ghana, which is called, the country called Ghana today, in fact, mm. the reason the countries called it the Gold Coast was because of the amount of gold that is still found in there. But that gold became the basis of the Almoravid dinar in Spain, mm. which became the basis of European currency for centuries. Wow. When, and there was no money in Europe at that time. So that gold came from there. And yet, check it out, books were valued more than gold in Timbuktu at its heyday. And here's another kicker, a city that has received less coverage is known to be just as important Islamically and historically in African history, it is, which is also in Mali mm. today, Jenne. And it is said that perhaps the word Guinea, perhaps may, some say it's a Berber word, some say it comes from Jenne, but that's another story. I'm trying to give you the importance of literacy in the development of African culture. You know that Swahili and Somali used to be written in the Arabic script. Yeah. They used to use Arabic, yeah. And the Swahili, the Swahili had utendi, poetry, highly developed forms of reaching the public. So those people mm. who could not read, were, you would recite a body of work. It's only recently, you know, you've got your script in the, the Swahili and Somali languages have been rendered into yeah. the Romans. But previously, they used the Arabic script. And therefore, literacy flourished in these areas. Now, look, let me show you the power of literacy. I, I'm going to okay. rush ahead. Because I know you, you want me to wrap this up. Let me show you the power no, no, of no, literacy. No, no, you don't have to steal your time. Because I just don't, because you, we spoke about last time, you know, about your timing. So I just don't want to take yeah. much of your That's time. Literally, but, I, I, yeah, you, so I would, I, I would love you to actually explain more and dive deep into this. Because this is like, I've been wanting to have this discussion with you for a while. So please mm. take your time. Don't worry. I was going to talk about Ahmed Gray. No problem. Yeah, That's go on. your end. Now, I, I've often told people, you might yeah. hear me obsessing about West Africa because that's my chief zone of research. I respect. Yeah, okay. I'm not, yeah. not conversant. You see, I've just, as I said, I'm just trying to swat up on my... On my... Uh, on my yeah. Yeah. Can you all see yeah, it? I'll, yeah, I'll, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. yeah. I would like to get a copy of that, um, Shalom, yeah. one day. Yeah. So... What, I'm, what I was about to say is that um, one of the reasons why mm. Somali peoples struggled mm. to defeat Ethiopia, you tell mm. me why. Um, from from a Somali <laughs> perspective, <laughs> it was the Europeans. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I should have never put the question like that. I should have <laughs> one of the things, okay. You are almost okay. Let me let me let me rephrase it to save myself. Okay. Are, the Muslims had almost defeated completely the Ethiopians. But okay. after they got pushed back, they had done a lot, they had wrought a lot of destruction to the highlands, the Muslims. Mm -hmm. A lot of mm -hmm. churches, cathedrals, monasteries. What revived, what helped revive Ethiopian civilization? Mm. Right. Literacy. Writing. 
Okay. Literally. Okay. Do not hide. When people dis- depreciate, because there's this notion that there's one kind of Africa, and I keep coming back to the subject, Yahelid, there's no mm. one way of being African. But we have this True. feeling that if a culture doesn't have drums, it's not really an African culture. If a mm. culture does not circumcision, it's not really an African culture. The Tutsi only recently started to circumcise. Exactly. Yeah. There's no one way of being. And if a culture doesn't have, I was going to say one, some other thing. If it's not an oral culture, it's mm. not truly mm. African. No. Oh, if it doesn't have roundovels, tukuls, uh, houses that are circular, the circular houses. If, it, yeah. if the houses are square, then it's not really African. No. No, no. There are many ways of being Africa. And what I would say is this. The Ethiopians had a sense of themselves in history because of the Kebarnagast, which was, whether we want to believe it or not, their interpretation of of their historical origins. Mm. The Kebarnagast. And it gave them a sense of identity, just like we Muslims had a sense of identity. Wherever you found our people with a sense of history, And that sense of history was written down so we can access it. So you can't just kill all the elders with the memory and then the history is lost. Those people were able to bounce back. And I think that was the main, because with with the conflicts between Ethiopia, Christian Ethiopia, and Muslim Somali and the uh, uh, Duran, the uh, uh, Adal and Ifat, Adal and Ifat before, right? With those kinds of conflicts, both sets of people were literate. Mm. And you know, and to me, when you look at that fight, that went, that dragged on for a couple centuries, because both sets of people had a strong sense of who they were in history. Mm. And to sure. me, literacy, not just orality. I'm not for the for the record. I'm not depreciating orality or preliteracy. I am not mm. putting down the oral tradition. The mm. prophet himself he said, "Correct me if I'm wrong." In the okay. beginning, he was reluctant. To have the Quran written down because mm. it's Arabs at that time, like most nomadic people, were mm. uh, an oral society. Remember, the Prophet mm. represents mm. people in transition, they were not Bedou anymore. Those who had settled in Mecca, Mecca and Medina Al Munawwara, they were not proper Bedouin, but they perhaps their grandparents were Bedouin. And they still had this notion of to be to uh, to acquire the attributes of moroa, manliness. Moroa, mm. you have to send your child to the desert, the bad year. So he will learn archery, he will learn hunting, he will learn privation. He can tolerate heat, he can tolerate thirst. He will become a man. So there was that sense. So and you know, like with Somali culture, <clears throat> the mm. notion of orality, poetry, mm-hmm. is cardinal cornerstone. Mm-hmm. Of, of expression and i mean through through somali poetry that's like if you really want to find out or if you really want to because we, we haven't written history but if you want to seek somali history what you find is within the poetry and within the tribal lineages because it's, it's orally transmitted and you're right yeah mm. yeah you see so i believe that uh, literacy in africa added to that it didn't detract from it people mm. think no it, it killed no it, i don't think um literacy In fact, we could have done with more literacy. The reason the Muslim world in general began to fall behind was when Johannes Gutenberg in Germany, I think, or yeah, the town of Mainz, invented the printing press. The printing press was, I forget, 14 something. The printing press, the late 15th century. The printing press was uh, invented in, I think it's the town of Mainz in Germany. It's in Europe anyway. Okay, Remember, I don't, I don't know. But yeah, yeah, the Chinese had been doing printing with printing blocks. And the mm. Chinese invented their own form of paper, which we Muslims got from them. The Muslims got paper from the Chinese when they encountered each other in a battle in Central Asia. Okay. The Chinese fire, I think it's the town. It, this brain is getting old, but you can always double check. I don't yeah, know if the, no Tang, the Chinese Tang Empire was pushing mm. westwards. The Muslims at the time were pushing east. They clashed mm. in the places like Bukhara, Samarkand, those, mm. that, those places like that. And that's where the Muslims acquired the science of paper from the Chinese. 
Uh, which made it, it, made is, it this, is this during the Tatar period? Um, like the King, uh, Genghis yes. Khan? Before, before Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan uh, is the 13th century. Genghis Khan is late. It was Mongolian. It wasn't Chinese. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah he's the Tatar, the Mongol. No, these were more yeah. Central Asians, kind of Turkic, proto-Turks, Turkic people. Uh, like in, like, like it's big and Turkmen and those sort of people. Mm -hmm. But the Chinese weren't attempting to conquer those people. But at the same time, the Arabs had their designs, the Muslims, sorry, had their designs because mm -hmm. a lot of the Muslims were already Persianized. We're moving True. east. The clash occurred. They conquered the Chinese, stopped their advance, and learned from them, learned from them how to use paper and develop the science of writing. Now, the Europeans went a step further. Remember, the Europeans had taken the idea of paper from the ancient Canetians, the ancient Egyptians, the, rebel, okay. the, the Romans in particular. Okay. When the Romans conquered ancient Egypt in about 47 BC, please do mm. my, your, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I'll, I'll do. Okay. When the Romans conquered ancient Egypt or Kemet, mm. they learned how to use um, um, papyrus from them. So the Romans began to use paper and it helped actually develop the Roman Empire. The use of literacy gave the Romans an advantage. So Africa, again, teaching Europe, gave the, uh, the Romans the advantage over the, uh, the barbarians, the Celts, they call them barbarians, I'm just using the word, the Teutons, yeah. the German peoples yeah. and the, yeah. the Gauls and the, his, the, those people that they were conquering up in Europe. It gave them the advantage, the idea. Just imagine, imagine if you will, my people are fighting your people, but I have got this information on a piece of paper as to where your army is going to pass. And I put that, I attach that to the foot of a pigeon and I release it to my people up ahead. Wow. So they know exactly where you're going to be because of writing. So with writing helps steal a march. So it's not mm. only about even military, for military strategy, not even about the, the love of learning. Now, what happened with Europe is, Europe, with the fall of the Roman Empire, Europe lost the art of, they lost contact with papyrus from ancient Egypt. Remember the Muslims conquered Egypt, Rome had mm. fallen, Muslims conquered Egypt, blah, blah, blah. For a long time, Europe had to rely on vellum. Vellum is parchment made from the skins of cows, mm. sheep, goats. You have to really treat it. You really, it's a really, it's a love of labor and it was very expensive. So people were not, there was a, a diminution, diminution of literacy in Europe after the Roman period because books, um, fold became, folios, books became so expensive because they were made from vellum, made from parch, animal skin, parchment. However, when Johannes Gutenberg invented the printing press and mm. now with paper they got from China, like how we Muslims got paper from China. Remember, with that paper, look at the civilization of Cordoba in Spain. Look at it. Look at wow. the civilization of Baghdad. Look at the civilization of Timbuktu. Look at Cairo. Look at the Kairawan. All of this has to do with literacy. And of course, as I said, the fact that we conquered the Chinese, stopped them and we stole their paper. <laughs> now, the Europeans did the same thing, but they went a step further. The yeah. Europeans invented the printing press. We, here's the problem. The Arabic script did not, it's not printing press friendly. The early mm. printing press was angular. The, the block, things on which you imprinted the letters was very angular. It suited the Roman script. It would mm. have suited Hebrew. Hebrew is very angular. But it didn't suit the Arabic script. Lots of mistakes were made. And then the Arabs began, the Muslims began to feel that it's a desecration of God's holy word that you can put it on something to print it without the dedication of the man, the hand and the pen. Here you're using this, me this mechanistic form, which is corrupting the word of God. So for a time, that short window of time before Muslims realized the importance of the printing press, Europe leapt ahead in terms of proliferation of, now books could become so cheap in Europe, as opposed to the time of vellum and parchment, how expensive that was. Now it could become cheap. And you have to couple that with the age. So that sent a lot of, all of these, um, what do you call them? Discoveries in ancient 
um, in Spain, Moorish mm. Spain, you know, and in Sicily, Muslims again, Sicily, all that got into Italy. And now with the, able, the ability to, to accelerate the dissemination of that information, you get the Renaissance in mm. Italy. You get the age of discovery starting in Spain, the so-called age of discovery when they went to Europe. And then with all that wealth, they, so the knowledge they got by capitalizing on the printing press, which we could not easily do and perhaps didn't want to do, the Europeans leapt ahead of us the same way the Muslims leapt ahead of the pre-literate societies in Africa by introducing writing. I would stop you as well. That's, hmm. that's well said. Uh, mashallah. So, so basically, what what do you think of? So, okay, after literature, then where do we go from? Because like then the there was a time, like you've mentioned in Timbuktu, um, even in Somalia, Zayla. Um, I remember um, another Somali historian telling me that um, Muhammad Aftan, that there was a time when a particular uh, some uh, Arab scholar, uh, there were two of them actually, one of them went to West Africa to teach about Islam, I think he partic particularly went to Tubaktu to teach about Islam and when he went there he found out the like the accuracy of Arabic, like I mean the kind of Arabic they speak, their knowledge and the amount of, you know, he was, he was shocked, he was like whoa, like he stayed, he came here to teach but he, he stayed to learn and the same incident happened in happened in Zayla. So it shows that you know, in, and it's weird how Islam is always depicted as when like you know Arabs coming to us, teaching us how to be Arabs or how to be Muslim. And certain uh, Central like uh, African, uh, what do you call them, Central um, Af Afrocentrics, right? Um, they like to de to depict African Muslims as you know people who follow Arabs and you know, but they don't understand how much the Africans of Africa put into this knowledge of spreading Islam and how rich, you know, for instance, like, you know, when, 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 when European, when the European world came to Africa, they have dismantled the African world. Like they, they disabled us to the extent that, you know, it would take time for us to get up. Whereby when Islam came to us, it didn't disable us that much. Rather, it kind of, I would say, liberated you know, and at the same time gave us um, a broad, you know, acceptance of wisdom. So if I don't want to speak from my own desires, because a lot of people think I'm preaching. So if you could if, if you could touch on that particular part and then later on, maybe you can touch upon the negative things that we could say, you know, happen and then we can move on from there. Well, I'll do both. Um, I think what you're, you're, what you're saying has some merit, but as I said, there's always a bit of light and shade. And mm -hmm. um, human, as you know, humans are not perfect and mm -hmm. humans will in the in, in in the pursuit of an ideal sometimes the end justifies the means and they do wrong in order to get to that end mm. now i would say that there there was a period in history when mm. islam was spread more organically in africa and slavery as part of the universal human condition would have been a part of that history and therefore i understand when because of the poverty of the English language, the word mm. slavery is used to cover a wide range of institutions. On the one hand, from domestic servitude, mm. on the other end, chattel transatlantic slavery. And all mm. of this compressed under the rubric slavery. And we are then led to believe when Arabs enslaved Africans, mm. it was as bad as European transatlantic slavery. Now let's okay. pause for a second here. The answer okay. is yes and no. This is okay. the problem. Interesting, yeah. Islamic history is so much older than the European presence in Africa that at its yeah. early, the, at its beginning point, it was very much like the domestic servitude that Africans practiced on Africans. Even the warfare that was fought, the Arabs appeared almost another tribe of Africans. Mm. They almost appeared because they, the, the Nubians, remember we spoke about the Battle of 651, the Arabs yeah. fighting the, the, the Nubians. They fought yeah. with the same kind of weaponry. Bows and arrows, mm -hmm. as swords. It was the same, it was an almost level playing field. The difference is, 
the Arabs came with an ideology. And number two, this is where your people got to get a little bit of blame now. Okay. The Arabs were pastoral nomads. Mm. Pastoral nomadic people mm. tend to be a little more aggressive. <laughs> True. Can you imagine if the Maasai had a, a belief that told them go and spread it to all people? The Maasai mm. are warriors from birth. The Deacon of South Sudan are the same. The mm. Somali are the same. The Rendil, mm. the Turkan. These people are brought up in an environment. Remember, a nomadic person's wealth is in his camels or his cattle. That's it. Your wealth is literally moving with you. Mm. So it's like, can you imagine me walking around my whole bank account? Walking around the whole thing. Where I live. I go yeah, around man. like this the whole time. <laughs> You understand? Yeah. I gotta be a little touchy. Now, mm -hmm. this, I'm not, you know, people who say I'm using this, I am extending the, uh, the argument of the ice man and the sand man to include the savannah man. Well, yes, mm -hmm. in a sense, I am. If we say mm -hmm. geography is the mother of history and Europeans mm -hmm. have a naturally aggressive, na not nature, I find the mm -hmm. word too powerful, tendency. Let me choose mm -hmm. my word. Okay. Let's say, Europeans were molded by that ice, that hard, cold environment. They had to learn mm. to make jam, chutney, chili. They had to learn to salt and smoke that meat for winter, for, the, for when they couldn't get it, when the crops couldn't, when the fields couldn't bear crops, they had to preserve that food. That's how they invented mm. bread and stuff and whatever they invented. You know what I'm saying? Now, it would, that kind of climate would breed an aggressive people. Look at the Vikings. The most extreme example in the medieval era are the Vikings for 200 years, 800 mm. to 1,000. The Vikings drove the rest of Europe crazy. The yep. region where they came from, the soils, the winters are very long, the summers, mm. the hot period is short, and the soils were impoverished because of prior, prior glaciation. Mm. Geography, the mother of history. Glaciation had caused a lot of nowhere until they developed the kind of scientific agricultural technology to exploit the soils of Scandinavia. The Vikings were beginning to starve. So what they did, they jumped in their ships because they have a long sea coast with all those fjords and natural harbors where they could, you could park ships. They, they exploited the seas. And when they got across to Lindisfarne in England, they realized all these monks and priests have these golden candlesticks and all that stuff and they're sitting ducks they're civilized with all this beautiful illuminated management and they began to pillage and plunder and all the rest of it now i'm just using that writ large to show you how the european did his own people what they later on did to us because the vikings eventually let's call them nomads of the sea mm. if they are not land nomads like the mongols yeah. or the Arabs, they are sea nomads all right because you know they got as far as Greenland and Iceland. Yeah, yeah, because they've been traveling a lot with the sea and coming back. Yeah, it's like the difference. Like we traveled on desert, they traveled on sea. So. Right now, that's what I want to come. That's geography again that I wanted to start. Mm -hmm. But you know, we we have a free ranging where we talk like we still in speakers' corner. Right? We just start free ranging. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. I wanted to get to that idea of this ice man inheritance. Mm. The sand man, the desert is also a very exacting environment. The Turks, who were the people who picked up the banner of Islam, first mm. the Saladik, the Seljuk, and then the Ottoman, the Ottoman Turks, mm. who picked mm -hmm. up the banner of Islam from the Arabs mm. via the Persians, mm. were cold desert nomads. They're from the desert, which is a, is a cold desert. That's why they, mm. they, they make those beautiful carpets and stuff like that because yeah. of the coldness of the environment that they come from. So mm -hmm. it's that same harsh environment that breeds that martial, militant spirit. Similarly, you go to a hot part of the world, you get the desert Arabs. That same militant attitude, even the prophet had to say in the Quran that they are, they are powerful in hypocrisy. What he yeah. was saying, he's now speaking as, a, as if he's not a nomad. He's now speaking like a man who's settled saying, why are these people so clan-based? You can't <laughs> trust them. You make a deal with them. Say, we have a fact. We all in this together. Mm. But then, he's Mijerted. What do we Mijerted? This not all of <laughs> You see what I did there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is the mentality of people from the desert. You pick 
mm. with your own kind. You know these mm. people because you carry your wealth on your back, man. Your wealth is your camels. Your wealth are your yeah. sheep. Your wealth are your whatever else you got there. You know, you used to have cows. That area was once green. And that's why yeah. in some of those regions of Maliland, you see the cow. Just like in ancient mm -hmm. Egypt, you see the same long horn cow. Just like exactly. the Tutsi. Listen, mm -hmm. this subject is big. I wish I had a whole day to sit and talk with you. Because right. I'm actually I'm actually just getting started on how geography is the mother of history. But you yeah. see, what we do, we, can, we can go for part two, you know? Yeah, we, we don't know. Yeah. Where we jump to, because I realized I didn't have enough time, I said, let me just jump at everything at once. Where we jump yeah. to with the printing mm -hmm. press is to show you where humans had now begun to control their environment, particularly mm -hmm. the white man. Mm. Once that age of discovery thing started, they developed boring into the wind sails. That means they could sail from Spain and Portugal back. They could come back. It is said that the Mandinka, the Muslims of ancient Mali, did sail to the Americas. But because they did not possess boring into the wind sails, it is not clear that they could come back. What is mm. known is that certain first and second voyages of Columbus, they saw black people there. They wondered why, they, and they saw them wearing long clothes, Muslimy looking black people, and yeah. they wondered at them. Some said that they were an Ethiopian ship. They didn't know what they were talking about. They said maybe an Ethiopian ship had foundered. Others thought there were some slaves of the native peoples there because they used to. But it, I surmise that those black people who they saw in the Darien Peninsula and places like that, I surmise they were Mandinka, Manding or Mande, people of the ancient empire of Mali, who sailed west, trying to discover new lands, but they could not easily always come home. I think before the boring into the wind sail was invented, the only way you could come back would be via the Gulf Stream, which takes you from Mexico, but lands you near the Azores or England. So they wouldn't have got back to Africa. There's a mm. current off the coast of Africa that will take you straight to Barbados, straight mm. to um, Hispan uh, Dominican Republic, straight to perhaps even Florida, Bahamas. But there was no current coming back. With the Somali and the Swahili, they used the monsoons. Mm. The monsoons would blow one way. That time of the year, they followed the wind. It pushed mm. them that way. When the winds reversed, they came back with the winds. And that was the difference. They didn't develop that technology because they didn't have to. They had the wind that would do that for them and they traveled seasonally. Their trade was based on that seasonal thing. But in the West, you, um, as far as the Europeans are concerned, I'm saying literacy and the wealth of the Americas that they stole from the native Aztec, the Incas, the Ma whoever else were out there, the wealth that they stole from the people, the, it's untold wealth, riches, that they piled into these ships called galleons and brought back to Spain, actually were responsible. So they no longer needed to rely on the Almoravid, the African gold dinar, because they were stealing and uh, exterminating peoples in the Americas and stealing wow. all their wealth. So there was that difference in history where they leapt ahead of us, both the Muslim world and Africa, with as I said, the invention of the printing press, but also the, the development of that kind of shipping that could take them back and forth. Also, the Muslim world suffered in 1258 a body blow by the attack of the Mongols. 1258, Yidagi, mm. yeah. the grandson of Chinggis Khan, destroyed Baghdad. First of all, he destroyed the, the empire of the Khwarazm Shah the Khwarazm Shah. He destroyed his empire, then went on to Baghdad. I think the last caliph, Khalifa Mustasim, was it? Check the name again, I may have forgotten. Yeah, I don't Khalifa know much about the Islamic history, but I think it was not. not, it was not, not so I'm not sure. You see yeah. what we go. I'm, I'm yeah. trying to make Islamic history and African history, world history. True. We, in Boktu and in Harar, are not the mm. edge of the earth. We're not the mm -hmm. periphery of the earth. With mm. the periphery of the earth, if we're looking at this through Eurocentric eyes, if we're looking at this through Eurocentric eyes, Tumbuktu and, and, and uh, Harar are the periphery of the Muslim world. Or, but we have to start say we have to start recentering ourselves in our history. And there's a lot. Okay, I did one part: domestic servitude. I did equal playing field. Nubians fighting 
Arabs, 651. I only told half the story. When they started taking slaves there, I imagine it to be not dissimilar not dissimilar to when the Nubian kingdom prior to the arrival of the Arabs used to be taking slaves from neighboring nations because the Nubians mm. were Christian. And even before Christianity, the Nubians were locked into the Roman world. Even the Garamantes, who are now, have nothing to do now, we are now in like Libya, Chad. Forget about uh, Sudan, Egypt now. We're going a mm -hmm. bit west. Also. The Garamantes, who are a mobile people, <coughs> or nomadic people, used to fight mm. with the Romans during the time of the Roman Empire. And at times, they used to trade slaves with the Romans. So in that sense, it is a part of the universal human condition we're describing. Just like I said, Vikings fighting the British or the Irish and establishing the town of Dublin or establishing the principality of Normandy in northern France. This is mm. white people, white people, one of them being a little more predatory and nomadic and the others being settled. Mm. Part of the human condition. Slaves... Yeah. Part of that, the Vikings were some of the biggest slave traders. But the yeah, Vikings they... was not a slave society. When you're talking about a slave society with a capital S S, that's mm. not, that's North America. That's the United States. It started okay. from its inception as a slave society. That marks it different from other societies that grew organically to a mm. point where they no longer relied on slaves. Now, the Arab world took a longer time because it did not enter an industrial revolution as did England in around 1733, when perhaps John Kay invented the flying shuttle and Arkwright invented the spinning jenny and then other machines were developed during the industrial revolution. And then all those cities with a lot of technology started to proliferate from the, then the Victorian era. That's now in the 19th century. Where there was an efflorescence of technology, road building, ship building, all kinds of technology. Now, Muhammad Ali Pasha in Egypt had attempted it. It was cut off. They did not allow it. First of all, he had problems with his Ottoman overlord and had problems with the, the, the French and the British. They were not keen that Egypt should embark upon its own industrial revolution. So the Arab world, pretty much like Spain and Portugal, and that's why even in the era of the big pirating nations, Holland, England, France, mm. Portugal was the first to start the colonial thing, as you know, from the Ethiopian adventure. You know, the Portuguese went yeah. all the, around the coast, the Cape of Good Hope. They saw all the Swahili mm. civilizations. They saw the, and they began attacking and burning down all those Swahili city-states. That's part yeah. of their own, own crusading mentality after having mm. been ruled by Muslims for about 700 years. <laughs> now, yeah, revenge, yeah. Yes, revenge. Now, but notice, after the wealth of the new world dries up, Mexico, mm. Peru, Spain enters the economic doldrums from which it never recovers. Other nations eclipse them. The English mm, cutting on them, the English pirates, Francis, Drake, Hawkins, these guys, cut, mm. sponsored by Elizabeth I. Yeah. <laughs> cutting on them, take away yeah. their trade. The Dutch mm. take away the Portuguese trade in the East. And so on, and the Iberian Peninsula, which hasn't undergone an industrial revolution, languages in poverty ever since. The Arab world had a similar problem where the Arab world never went into an industrial revolution. So, for a long time, out, what was outmoded in the West, the slave systems, continued in the Arab world. However, sorry, Arab world, the Muslim world. However, yeah. the difference in the Muslim world is that the Muslims began to acquire firearms, modern firearms. It is a game changer in how they conduct slave raiding among mm. Africans. Two things happen in the Ottoman Empire. They are defeated by the Russians. This dries up their source of Caucasian slaves, white slaves, because the Turks are equal opportunity offenders. They don't care what color you are. <laughs> if you're yeah. enslavable, they would enslave mm. you. Mm. They cut off the supply of slaves, so they began to focus their attention on opening up the Nile Valley, except now the Ottomans have high-powered artillery fighting peoples who were going nude, naked, like the Dinka, the Nuer, and so forth. Mm. And so the slavery now, let me come to that point. I won't get shy away from it. The slavery mm. of the eight, uh, 19th century Muslims begins to resemble European transatlantic slavery. 
mm. at that point in history. Then you have when Sultan Sayyid Said of Oman transfers the capital of the empire from Southern Arabia to East Africa, to Zanzibar, in fact. Mm. He brings all that weaponry, uh, Western, which he, some of it he got from the Ottomans, some from the British, all that technology into opening up East Africa to get labor first as porters for ivory. And I wanted to come back to ivory when discussing the decimation of Africa's ecology, because we forget that ivory was as important as gold. And many of Africa, West Africa's elephants have disappeared because of the trade in elephant tusk in West Africa. East Africa lasted longer because, as I said, the Omani slave trade, which had its headquarters in Zanzibar, took off much later in the person of leaders like Tipu Tib, Hamid bin Mahjub, Hamid bin Juma bin Mahjub, the famous mm. slave trader who was three quarter African, but his grandfather was from Oman. Mm. And these people extended his field of operations, first for ivory, they used to get black people, uh, Africans who live in the area, who did not live in centralized states. So we're not talking about the Batutsi or the Baganda or the Batoro. We're not talking about those Africans in ways like Rwanda and Uganda today who had, mm -hmm. or even, yeah, with those centralized kingdoms that would push back on slave mm -hmm. trade or raiders, not traders, slave raiders. They went to the more decentralized people like this. They were Sukuma and, mm. uh, and other people. And they began grabbing them and saying, you will now carry this ivory for us. When they got to the coast of East Africa, like Dar Salaam and Bagamoyo, mm. and Tanga, mm. they then enslaved mm. them and took them to, pl to grow cloves in plantations in Zanzibar. That is why wow. some people, you speak Swahili. Some people say the word mm. Bagamoyo, Wagamoyo. <laughs> It, the slaves were saying, this is the last time we will see when we drop our heart. Others say, mm. it's when David Livingstone's heart is buried. Allah mm. alim, people, I'm an old man, go do the research. But yeah. for some people, Bagamoyo, the town of Bagamoyo, Bagamoyo, where we Africans enslaved by these Arabs have lost our heart. And mm. even if that is not true, you go across the sea to the to Zanzibar, Nguja, you know, Zanzibar is two islands mainly, Pemba, mm. Nguja, you grow more cloves even in Pemba than in Nguja. But if you go to Nguja, you'll go to the slave caves of Mangapwani. The slave caves, and you will see that just like uh, you have got Gore Island in Senegal in the West Coast, Senegal, uh, Elimina Castle in Ghana, you, it, while not as developed, not as systematized, and I want to bring the nuance there, you did have slave holding areas off the East African coast and the Omanis are largely responsible for that. And a lot of the Gujarati Indians were financials in that slave trade. Some of those slaves ended up as far as India. Some of them were military. In the earlier period, a lot of them were military slaves. In the later period, they were laborers. That's why there's a confusion mm. in India between calling them Siddi, Saidi, lords. Mm. At one time, they were military slaves who rose to positions of prominence in government. But in the later period, in the period of the Omani slave trade in the 19th century, they were mm. mostly laborers. And that's why they have a low uh, status in Gujarat and places because of that. So there are two periods, I would say, of Arab or Islamic or Muslim slave trading in Africa. In the early stages, it was almost like African on African. To a large extent, it's equally matched people fighting. Yes, there was the Zanjabizing sidebar and come back to that another day. But in the mm. latest days, I cannot get away from the fact that those Arabs and Ottomans were using high-powered artillery like any European. And I don't know if you, anybody has any question because I may have skipped or forgotten something to add to that. And by a question or two, maybe I'll have a, 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 a okay. jog memory. I may have a memory jog. Okay, so everyone who's watching this, if you have any question regarding the impact of Islam had in, uh, in, in Africa, please drop your question. Um, now we're taking in questions. Uh, okay. Um, uh? So, yeah, people just, yeah, they're just having their own little debates in this section. Yeah. Um, so basically... I could, I could, yeah, continue until, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So we spoke about literacy. We spoke about geography and we spoke about, you know, the negative aspect of. But can we not say that the negative parts of the like, because people like to use Islam. So can we not say instead of um, saying Islam, can we not say it's um, it's Arabs who are doing this? Because there is the because even the Arabs knew when they take slaves and they wanted to mistreat these slaves, they never wanted them to accept Islam because they knew once these people accept Islam, they're no longer their slaves and they have to free them and they have to suppress that. So it was more like Arab greed than Islam. Can, can, we, can we put it that way? I'm conflicted about this because I like to think there was an element of racism in it. Not mm. racism as writ large as European racism, which became scientific. European racism began to be underpinned by science which made it even more pernicious. The corruption of the Darwinian theory into biological, social Darwinism becoming biological Darwinism. The black man closer to monkey than to man. People like Hume and Trollope who wrote papers say the black man was closer to monkey than to man. Yes, mm. the earlier stages of our Arab history, mm. people who didn't have enough information despite their intelligence, and you can't fault their other, you know, their, their other good, their other virtues. People like Ibn mm. Khaldun did make comments that were a little bit Afrophobic. No, not a little bit. They were Afrophobic. But again, to bring the nuance, he said as much about the Slavs. So people who were too white or the people who were too black mm. are both lacking in wit and sharpness of thought and intelligence. Uh, I think he went into even more detail about black people and I'm, I'm not going to pretend that he didn't. He said worse things, I think, about black people and about Slavs. But basically, the Arabs have always considered themselves, or when I say Arabs now, Ibn Khaldun is from North Africa. Mm. Arabi, Arab. Okay, if you want Mustarab, to say yeah. Arab and Mustarab, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, mm. you know how I drop it in speaker's corner, A-Rabs and B-Rabs. <laughs> B-Rabs. <laughs> I'm on a yeah. professional platform here. I must maintain my, my, my poise and my dignity. So, yeah, no problem. When we talk about people like Ibn Khaldun, their belief was that the Ummat Wasata, the middle nation, can almost be interpreted literally, i.e., they were not too black, they were not too fair. They were mm. the middle nation. The people to the north were frozen, their minds had become frozen. The people to the south, their minds, they see how the hair is curly. That we, mm. our, our brains had become fried. So they mm. believe they were the ideal, the middle nation people. And there is, but it doesn't go into the kind of science that you will get with the Europeans in the later period, or like during the, the 19th and the 18th and 19th century. But there is a lot of Afrophobia to the, to, to the extent that Al Jahiv, writing in the ninth century in Baghdad, center of mm. learning. And as you see some of my books there, he was a man with so many books, Al-Jahid, that, and he lived to a ripe old age. He was in his nineties when he died, Al-Jahid. He died by his library falling on top of him. He might've been still alive today. <laughs> he, wrote, Imagine. Yeah. he wrote something called um, Mafakhir al as Sudan al al the boast, the, the declaration of pride mm. of, on mm. the part of black people over white people. And okay. why would Al Jahid have to write that? It, it does speak to a certain amount of negrophobia or Afrophobia as early as the Abbasid period. It must have, because soon after that, you have the Zanjab rising mm. in Basra. Mm. south of Baghdad in the 9th, 10th century. And a large number of those slaves, a goodish number were black from East Africa, Zanj. It means that a large number, not all were black, but a goodish enough number to tell you that there was some Afrophobia, Negrophobia, anti-blackness as we're calling it today. So that existed in the Muslim world then and it exists now. And I don't know if the knowledge Arabs, Peninsula Arabs, were much darker in color. I'm not saying they were Negroid. 
Mm. I'm not saying we look like Marcus Garvey or Robert Mugabe or Idi Amin. I'm not mm. saying that. Right? Mm. I, I put my card straight. I'm I'm not going to go from one extreme to the other. Okay. But Arabs, Arabs may need to understand that they were much darker skinned at the time of the Prophet than they are today. That's true. Now, yeah. If you look DNA at DNA supports that. DNA supports yeah. that. You're right. Yeah. yeah. Look at the words for color they use. People have to mm. look at them as comparatives or relatives. They're comparatives. Mm. The primary colors are all in the shape of, you know, you have the word Kabir. The, I, I know you know your Arabic grammar. I'm speaking for yeah, people who yeah. don't. You have Kabir, oh. meaning big, and bigger is Akbar. You have Latif, meaning pleasant, and you have Altaf, more pleasant, more agreeable. You have mm. Jameel, meaning good looking, and you have Ajmal, even more good looking. So mm. that structure of word, the colors, the primary colors only come in the second form. Abut, white. Akhdar, green. Azraq, blue. Ahmer, red. They don't come. In other words, when an Arab is saying red, he's saying redder. Asfar, yellow. When an Arab is saying yellow, he's saying yellower. When an Arab is saying black, aswad, he's saying blacker. When he's saying white, abut, he's saying whiter. Why is the word structure like that? It seems to me that Arabs used colors, primary colors, not Bortokal or Rabi, not those later colors, mm -hmm. the primary mm -hmm. colors. They used these colors as points of comparison. In other words, an Arab would say, I am black. And when you see that in the literature, you run away thinking, oh, the Arabs look like the Dinka of South Sudan. Mm -hmm. No. When he's saying he's black, it's comparative. I'm black and compared to Turks and Persians who are red. Mm. Red. And when the Arab in the early, when the Umayyad Arab said that, he spoke with a, super, a, 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 a sense of superiority. I am black, but he means us what blacker in comparison to them. However, look at what happens when the Arabs go and fight the Nubians who defeat them. The Nubians defeat them at the first cataract in Egypt. They draw an imaginary line in the sand and they call the land to the south of it, Bilada Sudan. Now, the same Arab who call himself black in comparison to the Persian and the Ot and the Turk is now calling those people black. Black is Sudan. Now, because he, now in comparison to them, he's not black. But in comparison to the Turk, he is black. The, the, I, I don't know if that makes any sense. The terms for color are comparative. The structures of the word, Abyot, Akhbar, Azraq, Ahmed, Asfar, the structure of the word is a comparative. It, it, it's, as if it, it's as if there is no word in English for black, it's blacker. There is no word for white, mm. it's whiter. There's no word for red, it's redder. There's no word. It's just like the layer of the color just getting more brighter. Yeah. Yes. No, it, no okay. what I'm saying is, what it seems to me is that mm. Arabs looked at color, the adjective, as a comparative term. I am black in relation to the Turk who is red, but I am white in relation to the Nubian who is black. Oh, okay. I don't know that. I'm trying to see if I'm, I'm, I hope I'm making sense of myself. It's, yeah, it's like, um, it's like saying, it's like, it's like comparing East African to other Africans or maybe North Africans to East Africans because there is, there is layers of, differentiation for some like north africans are more lighter compared to east africans right. but then east africans or the Cushitic people look different to yeah. other africans by skin mm. tone also by features so in that sense you could say when an arab says i am black like basically he's not as he's not as white as you know these caucasians mm. like you know white yeah. people blondie and you know, all that he was speaking yeah. with a he was using the term in mm. self in a self congratulatory manner and when he was mm -hmm. talking about the Turk as red he was speaking mm. in a derisory manner mm. because the Turks were less they were more in a position of advantage to the Turk however i don't know that that can be said to make complete sense because the persians who they conquered they also called them red and the persians civilizationally were ahead of the arabs but anyhow they called those people red people I know definitely with the, sometimes with the Turks, the, the, the room, the Turks of Asia Minor. Well, it wasn't Turks mm. yet, but the people where Heraclius came from, the emperor. You know where it's called yeah. Turkey today? It wasn't Turks then. They weren't Turks then. That, uh, they used to call us the Shukr, the blonde people. Ashkur, blonde. And with, a, with contempt, the term blonde. Now imagine today when you see Arabs 
tripping over themselves trying to get blonde women. Back then, they weren't rolling that way. Check it out. Mm. Because the word aswad, if you look at the root of the word, it seems to have connotations of Lord, Sayyid. Sayyid. So in the old days, the darker color, I'm not saying again, they look like mm. Marcus Garvey or Robert Mugabe. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying mm. is, the sense of being darker was something to be proud of. Mm -hmm. The word Aswad seems to be related to Sayyid and Lord. The word Lord. It has connotations of mastery, of goodness. Yeah, and also we, to add to that, you know, when it comes to Bilal, I don't like how they depict him on uh, on these Arab films uh, when they talk about the Sahabas and stuff. But Bilal kind of, we could say in skin tone, he had like your kind of complexion because he was... um. Uh, he, he was said to be, first of all, he was an Ethiopian and his father was an Arab, right? And his mom was an Ethiopian and he had a lighter skin. And when people discriminated against him, it wasn't because of his scholar, I heard. It was because of his, you know, Ethiopian lineage. Because remember, Ethiopia, Abyssinia, invaded Arabia at some point. Uh, you know, uh, you know, the elephants and all that stuff. So in that sense, yeah, but then they they tried to depict it as if, you know, the Sahabis hated Bilal because he had dark skin or he was blacker than black and all of that stuff. You know, um, that's that's what I think. W what do you think of that? I'm conflicted a little. I, I, let, let me disagree slightly. I'm disagreeing from Go a on. point of view. Look, I'm, let me say straight away, I'm disagreeing from a point of view of very slender knowledge on this subject. Mm -hmm. I okay. just know that there are some contradictions in Arabic history, mm -hmm. Arabian history, like calling somebody al Habashi through his mother. Arabs tended not to locate a person's ancestry matrilineal. Mm -hmm. The Arabs always tend to look at a person through his father's lineage. And that's why I find calling him uh, Habashi, if I, 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 I don't know how much credence I put to that. I do know that the, the Abyssinian adventure mm -hmm. in South Arabia was very short-lived. Mm -hmm. It was not as long as people are making mm -hmm. out. The mm -hmm. period when Belqis, the Queen of Sheba, mm -hmm. said to have visited Nabi Sulaiman alayhi salam, mm -hmm. the dates don't match up. The dates for the, the rise of the kingdom of Yeha and Aksum mm -hmm. and the period of Sulaiman, which is mm -hmm. 669 BC, the dates mm -hmm. don't align. Mm. What it tells me is that there was frequent intercourse between mm. South Arabia and the highlands of Ethiopia. No doubt. Even the word Habasha. There was mm. an, there is a tribe still in Yemen called Habashat. Mm. And the South Arabian script is what gave rise to the Ga'az Ethiopic script. So there is a connection. Whether the connection holds true with the historical linkages that I mentioned earlier that are found in the Kabarnagas, I cannot say. As for whether Bilal's father was an Arab, I really cannot say. I do okay. know that even in Ethiopia, there were gradations of color and the highland people, if you want to call them to separate them from the rest of Ethiopians, if we want to call them the highlanders, the Abyssinians, the Semitic mm. people, such as the Tigray, the Tigrinya, and the Amarinya, the Amharic speaking people, and perhaps in the Guraji, because that's also a Semitic language. Uh, Harar, but Harar is just in one little town. Forget Harar for now. Those mm -hmm. highland people did tend to have a superiority complex over the Oromo. And the Oromo and they had a superiority complex over the Omotic and the Nilotic black people. I suspect, mm -hmm. and I don't know, I stand to be corrected, that Bilal was the product of an enslaved Omotic or Nilotic speaking African from which is in Ethiopia they call the Southern Nations provinces. I don't think he was a Highland Ethiopian. I don't think he okay. was an Abyssinian. I think he was like a, you have Nuer that are in Sudan that also live in Southern Nations province in Ethiopia. You have mm. Karo who are Omotic speaking from the Omo River. The Omotic, you have the Shankela, which is a very bad word in Ethiopia. It can mean uh, Shankela or Beria. If you call somebody mm. Shankela, or bury it means like nigger. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, need know, to, I, I need to look out for that word, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or bury it. It has a very mm. bad meaning. And it refers to those tall black people that you find in the Republic of South Sudan today. 
because they share a border and they spill over into what has become Ethiopia. You know, Ethiopia wasn't mm -hmm. always that, you know, how Selassie yeah. and other people, the nations, mm -hmm. they gave them then they gave them parts that didn't belong to them. And so forth, but that's another, I don't want to lose, have problem with my Ethiopian and my Rastafarian <laughs> brother right now. I want to keep it nice and holy because yeah. in history, we all pilfered land from each other. We all grab mm -hmm. a bit from each other. It's just that, once the Europeans started sitting in a room in London and drawing maps of places they never saw, they made concrete lines between people who were supposed to be together. And your people, the Somali, are one of the most classic examples of these lines drawn where they should not have been drawn. Mm. Thank you very much, Uncle Njuma. Um, there, was, there was one question uh, that came up. I was trying to look for it while you were talking. I kind of lost because like, people are just commenting. Um, mm. Is someone asked about the Arabization uh, of the Horn of Africa. Um, I don't know, a lot of people think the Horn of Africa, like we, we only, you already covered this, but I think new people keep joining and I think they're probably missed on this one as well. But mm -hmm. is there such thing as the Arabization of the Horn of Africa? I mean, I find that like... Recently, it's recent. <laughs> recent. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's recent. I'll mm -hmm. tell you what I know. I'm giving you my... I'm going to be 60, inshallah. Allah give me the inshallah. life. I will be 60 next year. Wait, inshallah. Inshallah. I could tell you this. I have been living in this country since 1984. I have had Somali friends since that time, and they did not walk around in black abayas. I'm not, mm. I'm not this abaya. Wait a minute now. Mm. But okay. they were not walking around London in abaya, and the men were not, they may have a kofia or may mm. not have a kofia, but they mm. did a safari suit, sometimes mm -hmm. an African meshiki, the short shirt in the summertime. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I didn't see that many thobes, the synthetic made in China by starving children, thobes made in the mm -hmm. Philippines. And they weren't wearing those thobes. And the women were in reams and reams of black. And after, like about the end of the 90s, because I remember the only country in East Africa I didn't visit was Somalia in 1988 when the problem started. And I was on the Kenyan border as I traveled through Egypt, Sudan, Ethiopia. And then I went to the Eastern part that I've been discussing, Kenya as far down to Mozambique. But I wanted to see Somalia on my way back and I couldn't because the war had just broken out between the North, the Somaliland, uh, I think it was a secession and something happened yeah. there. And it's the only part of that area I never managed to go. And um, I know the prophet were Maui's. I don't know about the prophet wearing it. I've not, I don't even know if the Prophet Thobe was a tight Thobe made from synthetic material by Filipino children in a sweatshop factory with a collar tied up to the neck. So when you bend down, all your all your anatomy is showing when you're doing sojourn. I don't think the Prophet wore that. <laughs> no, okay? mm -hmm. I think if you wore a Thobe, it looked like the Sudanese Thobe. Wide, loose, give you a lot of room and movement. And in that heat, you need the sleeves to be wide so that the air can circulate. Mm -hmm. See, if you wear yeah. Thobes like that they're pushing on us now. They got air conditioning in their house, air conditioning in their car, and air conditioning in their office. They don't, so that's why they could wear that synthetic material, which makes your underarm stank. Because that material is not to be worn. It is not good for your skin. Now, I'm also going to say, I wanted to talk about environmental things too. Cotton too. Although I love cotton, cotton yeah. is, uh, is environmentally not the best, most friendly material. But that's a sidebar. Yeah. I, you know, so I saw somebody throw up a, comment about the prophet war thobe mm -hmm. and i just wanted to address it just took, you know I, I went into speaker's corner mode and i went around i went down that rabbit hole for a second um yeah. what tell me what was i talking about i saw the <laughs> comment and I, went, and, I, and I went i went off my feet now so basically uh you were talking about the, the how cow cotton it's um yeah it's, no, I was, no I, that was part of the sidebar too no yeah. what i was talking i i think that i want to say basically that Islam in Africa has had a checkered history. Mm. I can't say the good things were Muslim and the bad things were bad Muslims. I gotta say Muslims did this and Muslims did that. Muslims did good things and Muslims did bad things. If the bad things were so bad, it made them bad Muslims, I have to call them bad Muslims. If the good things were so good, it made them good Muslims. Yes, there were good Muslims and good things happened, but there were bad things too. I believe slavery is a universal human condition and Africans up to today, there are some parts of Africa that still indulge in domestic servitude. Sometimes it's mm. even worse. However, 
I do believe that in the beginning of time when Arabs invaded Africa, the slavery was very much uh, slavery like African domestic servitude, the Akan of a proverb, the slave who serves well succeeds to his master's property. There was room for advancement, promotion, freedom and elevation. A woman giving birth to the child of a master, the woman a slave, that child was not a slave. There was room for social mobility in that kind of slavery in Africa and in the early Arab phase. In the late Arab phase, so the late Muslim phase, the 18th century, that persisted, but it became mechanized and conveyor belt with weapons of mass destruction. So in that mm. sense, I have, to, I have to put that into the mix and say, you got to subdivide slavery of and the Africans being enslaved by Muslims into two phases of history. You have to do that. You can't just use the word slave as a white man does. It's his convenient way of masking differences, of saying, oh yeah, the Muslim did this, you Muslim did the same thing, we white people did, so what? Why are you black people in America converting to Islam? The Arabs were slavers too. It's a way of masking differences. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Um, now, final, the final question. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually preaching into your time limit. Yeah, um, cool. The final question is that, okay. um, yeah, is that uh, <clears throat> since we're talking about how Arabs, how Arab, uh, Arabs or Muslims, uh, who actually had uh, Arab or Turkic, you know, um, uh, identity, I should say. Um, how about when? What about what do we have to say when Africans, when when Islam came to Africa and they became very uh, prosperous and they be, they turned into empires and you know they were out there conquering the world. Um, what do we say about did, you know the the amount of impact African African Muslims had on the outside world? Like, let's start from west from west to north to east. You know how much impact did these Africans had in the world? Well, like I said, in Borno, Kanem Borno, mm -hmm. they were known for their scholarship as far as the Hejaz and Cairo in Cairo at the Azhar University, which incidentally was first the Shia University, the Fatimiya, who conquered Egypt in 969 AD, established Al-Azhar University, and it was a Shia University mm -hmm. for those who mm -hmm. don't know. And uh, mm -hmm. to their credit today, they teach all the Madahib and all the rest of it. But there was, a, there was an, um, an, 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 an endowment set aside by the Sultan of Khanem Bornu for the upkeep of parts of Az Hazar University. And there was a lodge for students from Kanem, the empire of Kanem Borno in central Sudan. It's actually near Lake Chad in Nigeria today. Part, it mm -hmm. covered parts of the Republic of Niger, parts of Chad, parts of northern Nigeria. That area, in fact, at its greatest extent, the Kanem Borno empire reached Libya, the oasis of Kufra. And uh, yeah, so they were well known to the outside world. And um, the trading relationship with Kanem Borno later on in history, was one with the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire, which reached as far as Algeria in the 18th century, 17th, 18th century, they, Libya, the, Libya was one of their provinces. And because there, the Ottoman Empire bounded, had a shared a boundary with the northernmost marches of the Kanem Borno Empire, there was a relationship mm -hmm. between the Kanuri people and the Ottomans in, in, in mm -hmm. history. For time. Mm. Mm. So, okay. The, the, the trading relationship with West Africa and the, and the center of the Muslim world went on for a long time. The Hajj acted as a very pivotal uh, meeting point and ideas from the Caucasus, from Indonesia and from West Africa were exchanged right there. Notions of the Mahdi and the end of time and the jihads that arose from them. A lot of these notions came out of West Africa and actually pollinated notions of eschatology of Muslims, as far as I said, Central Asia. So they, they had people like Al-Hajj Omar Tal, who went and performed mm -hmm. long before him, the, the leader of the Almoravids who, who went on pilgrimage. That relationship that was formed with other Muslims actually kept African Muslims in touch with what was happening with the, the rest of the Muslim world. We got a lot of ideas from that, the, the fusion and interaction, and we also gave a lot to that interaction. We supplied a lot of ideas to that interaction as well. Mm. Wow, mashallah. And um, what about East Africa? Did they have any impact on the outside world? Well, the like East African, 
the East African uh, influence reached as far as Indonesia, um, okay. China. It uh, some say well northern Madagascar, the north western mm -hmm. Madagascar, um, the Maldives, the all those areas in the Red Sea are a result. Well, people put them all together. They throw Southern Arabians, by whom they mean Yemeni, Habarim, and Omani, Somali, mm -hmm. Swahili, all these people together. And because they interacted so well, it speaks to that kind of convivencia that Islam gave rise to. So it's hard to unpick one and say, did the Somali? No, it's only Somalis who did that. No, no, it's only Swahili who did that. No, it's only yeah. um, Madagascans or Comorians who did that. It, those people were like, like I said, the warp and weft of a loom that goes back and forth. They had so mm. woven their cultures in East Africa. But what I do know is their trading position would have made them a force to be reckoned with in the world if the Portuguese had not interrupted it and mm. that trade link with China had been strengthened. Can you imagine mm. the outcome in the world today? East Africa and China and all the countries in between would have been the power block of the of the of the future instead of the transatlantic powers the nato and all that transatlantic stuff we have going on today yeah that's really deep that's really deep really deep ending um uncle lejuma first of all i would like to say thank you so much for coming through um I, I i really appreciate having you on my channel and I do apologize because sometimes, you know, I'm not I'm, I'm new to myself, like asking questions and inviting people to my channel. Um, I just want, you know, I want people, especially I got a lot of youngsters who follow me, you know, who really want to learn about culture, history, about mostly my channel is based on Somali history. But um, I thought maybe how about the, how about I broaden the subject and turn into an African history? Let's see what the African world has to offer. And I would, you know, also I would love to have you again, inshallah, sometime whenever you know you have the time and we can maybe all those books that you have, um, you've read, mashallah, we can, yeah, we need all of that information. We need all that information here. All, all kinds of books. You see, people don't understand. I have books on ducks. What is wow. a Muslim doing reading that? You <laughs> have to read everything. Know your ecology. Yeah. Know your animals. Mm. I wanted to talk about African animals and Islam, but that's another subject for another day. Another we subject. Must have everything. We have Inshallah. to be like how Zahid, the great African polymath of Baghdad, he mm. was the uh, he was like the iris, you know, is that the black part of the eye? The iris? Mm -hmm. Back then mm -hmm. was like the, one of the eyes of mm -hmm. the Muslim world. The Muslim world at that time had two eyes. Cordoba mm -hmm. in Spain was one. Baghdad was the other one. Mm -hmm. And the iris of one was al Jahiz, the black polymath and scholar. And he read everything mm -hmm. and he wrote about everything. Jazakallah khair. Al-Jahiz, inshallah. Al inshallah. Al -Jahiz. Al -Jahiz. Al -Jahiz. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Inshallah, well, are you, you're very much welcome. Inshallah, binillah. And um, I'd like to thank the people who are watching this. And please don't forget to subscribe and share. I have a um, Discord page on Discord, or sorry, Discord server, where, you know, all um, different people come together. We discuss a lot of stuff. So if you are interested in, you know, communicating with me or asking me questions, or if you have any questions for Uncle Denjuma, come reach me on Discord and I'll, you know, straight deliver your questions to him and everything that you have, inshallah. And this is where we're gonna end our conversation. Um, inshallah, assalamu alaikum uh, wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Is there, before you end, is there any, any last thing you wanna say? That just a last, you know, uh, attachment to, to the young people watching? There is a famous quote. I wish I had, um, I'm gonna get the quote up here. I'm gonna get it. Oh, hold on, I'm coming. This is called, what okay. you call dead air, dead air on camera, right? Okay. This quote is very interesting. Mm. Can I? I'm not sure I'm doing it right. Yeah, ah, it's I too shiny. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In I can see that. The missing millennium. In this okay. book is about a guy called Akasha Adeli, an Egyptian guy. And in this book, he gives a quotation of Al Jahid. Um, mm. uh, it's, 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 I can't see it. It's a bit blurry. Oh, you can't. Okay, I'll yeah. read it in English. It's Arabic yeah. and in English. And Al Jahid, yeah. the great scholar, in a book called Al Haywan, the book of the animals, <laughs> okay. he writes this God made inherent in us the need for knowledge of the history of our predecessors, just as was the need of our predecessors for the history of their predecessors, and mm. just as will be the need of those who shall come after us 
Al Jahar. I wish I could read it in Arabic, but okay, there it is. you see it there. Yeah, I can mm. see it. Yeah, but it's like it's too it's too small to read. It's just like the camera is a bit ah. blurry. But thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you That's, so much. Thank you so much. I rather end with a quote from Al Jahir, the great yeah. black scholar, because yeah. it's Black History Month, and he mm -hmm. was writing a lot of he he had to write a lot of polemics and push back on, he had to push back on a lot of racist tropes that were around mm. at the time. So anti-blackness in the Muslim world is among Muslims is not new. And that's, okay. that's it's a sad note to leave on, but there you have it. <laughs> okay, no problem. All right, Salam alaikum. Please don't forget to share and subscribe, inshallah. Um, and uh, podcast ends now.